Hi, my name is Matt Hare. I am senior colorist at Ambassadors here in Amsterdam. I first got into color grading when I studied 3D animation at university, um, and that got me into the post-production industry in Soho in London. Um, I was a runner there for a while, and uh, I became interested in the telecine department. Uh, so I asked my boss if I could uh, become a colorist assistant, to which he said yes, luckily. Uh, 10 years later, here I am, still very happy with my choice. So I work mostly on commercials here with the occasional music video or short film. Amsterdam is a great hub for uh, advertising agencies and production companies and there's a really good blend of like local and international clients. So one day I might be grading a lo local supermarket commercial and the next day um, a global beer brand. So depending on how complex the project is, I'll try and get involved with the process as early on as possible. So this might mean doing a pre-grade for VFX to work with, and then a final grade again at the end. Or if time's an issue, then I'll grade at the end of the process after the VFX plates have been done, um, with a bit of back and forth perhaps between myself and Flame. Uh, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis really. Um, things often need to happen simultaneously though, um, and we're trying to be more flexible. So we're sort of using um, TrueLight's new color management system um, in the various different softwares around the building. So for example, our Nuke department have already been working with the Nuke plugin for some time now. Uh, and uh, with the release of the Pybox plugin for Flame, which we've been trialing with good success, um, it's my hope that going forward, we're gonna have like a complete non-destructive workflow around the buildings. Um, starting with BLGs to balance the rushes, right through to BLGs for uh, the final grade and making all the deliverables from it. When I set up my scene, I choose the Filmlight template, uh, which puts me into a T-Log eGamut working color space using the TrueLight Cam family of DRTs. I really like this as a starting point. It's very clean. It doesn't have a strong look to it, so there's a lot more freedom there. And I really just trust the Filmlight color science uh, 100% to, to know that almost any look I need is gonna be uh, achievable from this and any deliverable too. So once I set up my scene uh, and I brought in my footage, I'll start to work on my grade. First thing I do is create a balance layer as my layer one. And inside of that, um, most of the time, you'd, I just get away with using just base grade. It's uh, as long as you've got fairly well shot material, you can do most things with this. It's a very powerful tool, but I'll just work setting my exposure, uh, my color balance and uh, set uh, my black point with the flare. Maybe just bring some detail back in the window there, or perhaps just uh, the contrast overall. You know, just make it an, a, a nice, clean, soft starting point. Um, one which I can then match across the rest of the shots as well. I also had a compressed gamut straight after the base grade. Uh, what this does is it just compresses any crazy accidental out of gamut colors that might have come from the camera sensor, things that you generally don't want to be grading with downstream. So once I've done that, I'll apply this uh, balance to the rest of the shots as well and uh, adjust accordingly. Hopefully I'll do that before clients come in. So once they, once they do, we can uh, get going with the fun stuff together. And once I've also got my balance happening, I'll add a category to it, which I've called, I've created this in preferences and I've called it lock strip. Uh, and you can basically set it up so that uh, this can't be overwritten. So I can just audition different looks, um, dragging and dropping or using the scratch pad. Um, and it will update the look, but it won't change the balance strip. So that's very useful for seeing how your grade's gonna look um, across different shots. Next, I'll choose a look profile using the film like looks operators. Um, for this, I'm gonna choose earthy film and I'll, I'll find 100% a little bit too strong. Um, I, wanna, I wanna sort of feel the look a little bit. I wanna just feel the sort of the nice uh, analog qualities that they can bring to it. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily wanna see the luck that I've used. You know what I mean? I wanna just bring a little bit into it. So. Maybe I'll add a bit of that, or maybe I'll, you can use, uh, you could even layer these up and use another one and just blend a bit of two or more in. You can get some quite interesting results from that. So once I've chosen that, I'll go into my contrast layer and start to work on, on my contrast. My two tools that I like to use are film grade and base grade. Film grade, I just love, 
especially when working with SDR, it's still just got a really nice richness to it uh, and a saturation which it, it just just puts in just the right places and then rolls off into the shadows and the highlights. I certainly find it the most quick, fastest way of, of adding a nice S-curve to the image. But um, once I've done that, I'll also go back to base grade before that and just dig out detail which I couldn't get with film grade. So maybe the shadows got too compressed or something. Um, so I just change that, maybe add a bit more weight to the blacks. Bring the window back. You could probably achieve maybe all that within base grade. As I say, it's very powerful, but um, I still just, from my experience, just found film grade is just a, a really fast way to get there. And then just a little bit of tweaking with base grade gets a, a really nice look on it quite quickly. Um, I will also use a boost contrast operator, which is a, a spatial operator and it, uh, it works slightly differently to the other contrast controls. So it just digs out information and structure, which uh, you couldn't quite get with the traditional controls. So I like a bit of that as well. Uh, a little bit goes a long way. I don't use too much. Sometimes I just roll it off in the, in the highlights so it's not so strong on there. So once I've set my contrast, I'll probably save off a few different ideas with that. Um, and once we're happy with it, I'll move on to color. So I like to keep these separate. It's good practice to do that. You know, so if you change the underlying contrast, the color uh, is going to adapt to that. Uh, but it also means that I can change, I can turn one or, one or more off independently. So if the color's wrong, um, I can change that without having to affect the contrast uh, decisions that I've made um, and vice versa. So I have them separately and Within color, again, I'll, I'll probably use uh, base grade for a lot of it because it's just very precise at, at just um, adding color into different zones. You, I think you've got about nine different zones altogether. Um, so that's, that's very flexible what you can do there. And color crosstalk is also something which I don't use all the time, but when I do, it uh, it's, it's, gives a really interesting result. It basically mixes the color channels together, but balances the luminance for you as well. So it doesn't look crazy, um, but, uh, well actually it still does look crazy, <laughs> but uh, so much so that I actually often do it on a different layer because you can then blend back the result as well. But it's fun to experiment with. You can get some really interesting looks from it. Um, so I'll do that. Um, and once I've done working with my colors, I'll move on to texture. If we need any texture adding, maybe some grain or some softening, uh, I'll do this uh, this part next. Um, yeah, and uh, working with this, once I've got a look set with these few stacks um, or strips, I'll just go ahead and apply it to the rest of the shots um, as a sort of first pass. I'll come back and I'll do a second pass and I'll start working on it as a, as a sort of more of a shop specific basis, adding some localized adjustments to things uh, some uh, or some precise keying somewhere, just, just shaping the image a bit more. Uh, and getting uh, getting further enhancing the look. One technique I like to use for saturation and controlling the amount of it in my shots is to create a layer which I call high chroma desat. Um, and with this, I just use the hue angle, um, referencing the previous layer. It's important you do that, uh, and then solo the saturation part of the HSL key. And just using a layer mat so you can see the colors. I just bring the roll off right down and then bring the lows down to find the most saturated parts of the image. So you see the, straight away the neon sign comes through and then the umbrella at the back. And we'll just roll that off a nice amount till, uh, till we start getting to the colors which are okay. So something like that. So now we've got our most saturated colors selected. With that, we can now have a lot of control over desaturating just those parts. So you can see on the vector scope, it's very colorful. There's a lot of outer gamut colors happening there as well. So you could just go in with, with base grade, for example, and just desaturate them and clean that up quite a lot. Something like that. Um, and you know, doing that in a key is great because if I delete the key, you can see it does it on the whole image and you sort of lose saturation overall. 
which, you know, that's also good. It might be worth trying first off to begin with. But if you find that the whole image starts to feel too desaturated, then it's a good time to use this key just to get a bit more control over those extremes. Uh, what I like about the base grade as well is if you, if you do the saturation with this, um, you might say, well, actually, the, the neon sign, if I desaturate everything again, I like the, I like the umbrella and the spices, I like how they're a bit more realistic now, but the neon sign could be more colorful. So what you can do is you can do, use the saturation zones and you can just boost the, the bright parts there. I'm just gonna increase that a lot so you can see what I'm doing. Yeah, so if you reset it, hopefully you can see there. We're bringing the saturation back in the sign, but it doesn't affect the umbrella too much. So we get a bit more control there with with what stays saturated. So that's one, one thing I like to do with it. Another thing you can do is um, maybe using a hue shift, you could say, well, maybe my dominant color in this, in this palette is going to be the magenta and the red. So I'll just bring down the everything else, which isn't red and magenta. So we'll just go in there and just bring the green channel right down and the blue, cyan and the yellow, bring that right down. Again, just gonna push it a little bit more so you can see what's happening. Yeah, and that gives you probably quite an extreme look for this. Um, but you can see the idea. We're keeping the red and the magenta there while everything else becomes, um, fades away. Um, and if we did that without having the mask on it, it would be really desaturated and look quite bad. So that's a good example of why I think this mask is quite powerful. Um, and it's worth having at the end of your stacks, even if you don't always use it, it's just there sometimes to have as a nice, almost like a safety limiter of sorts, just to keep those unrealistic colors in check. When clients first walk in, they notice the blackboard too. Um, they're always quite impressed with that, uh, or the mothership as it tends to get called sometimes. Once we're grading though, um, the area and perspective tracker um, get remarked on a lot of people like that. Um, the 3D Kia, as well as the paint and texture tools. Um, I think overall, probably the speed of it, how clients can ask for multiple changes, I can build up lots of layers, and it will cache and play back in real time very quickly. Um, and also the reliability of the system. It, does, it doesn't often crash. Uh, and if it does, Filmlight's support is like a phone call away um, and things get sorted very quickly. It doesn't stay down for long. Uh, as a client, I would feel like I'm getting a premium service that I paid for. So Baselight has been introducing some really great texture tools for some time now. Um, and one of the more overlooked features I think of it is, uh, is the texture blend. Um, which is uh, in the drop-down box with all the other blend modes. Um, normally it's there, and you, if you choose texture blend here, um, it's really great for at, at least a couple of things that I like to do with it. Um, one of them is when you're adding a lot of contrast to a shot. Um, say you're just gonna, just gonna increase the contrast. I'll do it quite a lot so you can see the difference. Um, and when you add the contrast, you get all this extra perceived sharpness with it. Um, uh, which is which is very normal, but maybe you don't want that. Maybe it starts to become a bit too digital, too sharp, um, and sort of you know becomes further away from the original intention, uh, the original uh, intention of the DP, and maybe the lenses uh, weren't supposed to be that that sharp. So what you can do is um, with a texture blend, you can just blend back the previous layer's texture, and that has this effect of just softening off the the sharpness. So it's still keeping the richness and the structure of the contrast, but it's, it's removing those sort of high frequency um, edges that you, you, you get with it. Um, so if I do it all the way to the right, and it's blending in 100% now, you can almost see it, it almost has the effect of diffusing it. Um, so it goes almost quite soft, uh, which is maybe not what you want. It could be nice for skin tone or something, but for, for an overall shot, maybe just somewhere in the middle would be good. Just something which just takes the edge off and again, I've increased the contrast quite a lot here. I probably wouldn't have it that much uh, normally, but I think you can see the idea. I'll just zoom in a bit with it off. 
it's there. And then with it on, you just bring back some softness. And it's still doing, it's still doing, it's still adding contrast. It's not removing the contrast. It's there. It's just, just a bit nicer on the, on the edges. So that's, uh, that's my little tip for texture blend. Uh, definitely worth giving it a shot. Um, and you can see how you could use it on many of your sort of chroma adjustment layers or anything which uses uh, a keys or any time that noise might be introduced from, from uh, grade operations. It's worth just trying the texture blend and just seeing how it can clean up your, your layer.